right, this is the last lecture for today, and maybe almost the last lecture altogether. <clears throat> so we're going to just talk briefly about abundance estimation and differential expression, just to orient ourselves to some of the terminology and concepts before we go ahead and start estimating abundance and doing differential expression statistics. So you guys have actually already seen a plot like this, right? You were in IGB, you were looking at your RNA-seq alignments, and you could possibly see like some N bias, maybe if you had um, <clears throat> reads piling up in the coverage track more towards the three prime end, for example, than the five prime end. And you could have probably already started to get the sense from some of the genes we looked at that they were maybe differentially expressed, right? Where you had like, if you were to look at the absolute value of this coverage track here, I'm sorry, the numbers are very small, but it would show you that actually there's a lot more reads piling up in this top track than there is in the bottom track. And from that, you might conclude that the, the sample above is overexpressing or upregulating this gene, or the sample below is underexpressing or downregulating it. But of course, you can't do that systematically right from IGV and go through and look at them <clears throat> and even if you did there would be some biases or some some problems with doing it that way so we have to come up with some automated or systematic ways of estimating expression and I think from the very very first RNA-seq paper that was ever published this concept was already introduced because you immediately realize there's a couple problems with just looking at the read counts from a gene for one sample and comparing them to another sample or comparing them between genes, for example. And that is that we're counting fragments of RNA, but the amount of reads we get, which are somehow proportional to the fragments of RNA in our originating sample, are related to things like the size of the gene, right? So if you have a bigger gene that produces really long transcripts, and you fragment your RNA, you can get more fragments from that long RNA than you will get from say a really short gene. And then if you um, sequence one library more than another, that also really affects the number of reads that you get, right? So it's directly proportional. So imagine you have like a sample from your tumor and then you have a sample from your normal and you wanna know which genes are upregulated in the tumor sample, but then you sequence the tumor sample five times as much as the normal sample, you can't compare those counts. They're not apples to apples, right? You're gonna get more counts just because of deeper sequencing in one sample versus another. And often for these kind of RNA-seq experiments, we're trying to target similar amounts of sequencing per sample, but it just doesn't always work out that way. Um, when you take a sample and flow it on the flow cell, you try to achieve a certain density, a certain concentration, but it's variable and so forth and so on. So you basically need to normalize for these ideas of transcript size and library depth. And the first way that people came up with to do that was the RPCAM or what we now call FPCAM, which is just the number of reads or fragments per kilobase of transcript. So that's accounting for the size of the gene and then per million mapped reads, which is accounting for the size of the library or the depth of the library. And these are really the same concepts, the same terms. It's just, we originally called them reads because we were doing single read sequencing. And when we started doing paired end sequencing, there was this confusion like, well, I have two reads, should I count those twice? And of course the answer is no, you just count once per fragment. So the two reads are contributing to the one fragment count because they're pair reads. So what is FPCAM? I think we pretty much talked about the idea of it. It's just a, a simple normalization me measure or attempt to account for um, the bias that occurs towards larger genes and, and towards a larger total library depth. And there's different ways to calculate it. it it's kind of a relatively simple formula. So here's one example, you can take, um, calculate the number of mappable fragments for a gene, the total number of mappable fragments in the library, and then the number of base pairs in the gene, so the size of the gene, and then you can calculate it with this formula. But there are other expressions that are like arithmetically equivalent to that. 
there's lots of reading you can do about FPCAM. This is an old topic now. You may have also heard of TPM or transcripts per kilobase million. This is a slight variation on the idea of FPCAM. Um, I would say they're equally popular. Maybe TPM is even a little more popular than FPCAM. And they're accomplishing exactly the same thing. They're dealing for the transcript size. They're dealing with the library depth. Um, and they're just doing it in a slightly different way. So there's like a different order of operations essentially. And I'm not gonna go through these because it's kind of just like simple math, but um, you can study these and try and like convince yourself how they're different, but they're using the same values. They're just multiplying and dividing them in different orders, but they, they do result in one key advantage, which is that at the end, the sum of all the TPMs in each sample is the same. So it, what that allows you to do is a little more directly compare the TPM value between samples. So when you're comparing across a set of samples, the, the TPMs are a little more comparable because all the TPMs added up together always add up to the same thing, whereas that's not necessarily true with um, FPCAMs. So we're gonna use string tie to calculate FPCAMs and TPMs. Um, and there's also a way probably to make it do raw counts, but we're going to use a different tool for that. And StringTie is a very sophisticated uh, piece of software. So StringTie was designed by a group that's really interested in coming up with the best ways to infer the trans transcript level expression estimates, like isoform level expression estimates, not just gene level, but like each individual isoform that might be expressed from a gene locus and trying to do that with short read sequence data. So it's very much like designed to suit this very specific problem that we have. We don't have what we wish we had, right? Which is long read data, like where each transcript we just fully sequence and we get the full length sequence of the transcript. So we know what isoform it is and we could just count like how many reads, full length reads are we getting from each different isoform and know which isoforms are expressed and how much they are expressed relative to each other or between samples. And we could like sum them together to come up with a total expression from the gene locus. We can't do that because long read sequencing is still not quite cheap enough to like switch over to long read RNA-seq. And it hasn't been for the last 10 plus years. So people have thought really hard, like how do we make the most, extract the most value and information from these short reads, which are not really the ideal, right? Like they're two by 100 or two by 150. Uh, you're aligning them in this splice aware way, which is good. So you can like detect different splice sites and you can see which exons are connected together pretty well. And I think you saw that illustrated very nicely in IGB. But that's not really quite enough usually to like immediately figure out which isoform is expressed, right? Because if you think of a, gene, a human gene locus, especially many of them are super complicated. Like they might have 20 exons and those exons are used in 15 or 20 different ways, right? Like different combinations of them where many of the transcripts are almost exactly the same, but they'll just, you know, one of them will skip this exon. And another isoform skips this exon and another isoform skips both. And it turns out like it's quite challenging to tell all those subtle differences between all the possible isoforms. But these guys have done like a very careful job of trying to make that possible um, using like a series of clever graph theory and flow network theory. Um, which kind of like we talked about before, if you go and read the string tie paper, there's literally like tens of pages of math theory in the supplement explaining how it works. So we're not gonna go through that. That would be like a whole, it's pro it probably is like a whole course at Berkeley or something um, where some of these guys work. We're just gonna talk about it at a very high level. So what they do is they take our RNA-seq reads, right? This is like what we've been working with. They do alignments. You can optionally assemble them into super reads, but we're not gonna do that. Uh, and you map the reads to the genome in a splice aware way. And then from that, you construct a graph. And I'm going to show an example of what I mean by constructing a graph. And then you calculate, you construct from the graph, you construct a flow network, and you calculate the maximum flow abundance through different paths in the graph to estimate the expression of different isoforms. And that's how you come up with like 
um, an estimate at the isoform level for each possible transcript. And this software can do that both for known isoforms, and it can also be run in modes that infer isoforms. So like it can discover new isoforms from your RNA-seq data. So this is like from their paper, they have these examples illustrating how this works. Um, so basically they, they construct this flow network and um, they define these nodes. So where each node, the orange, the green, and the red correspond basically to the exons. So this is a very simple depiction of like a three exon um, isoform or three exon uh, gene locus, I guess. And then they um, take the alignments and they look at the alignments and they ask which alignments support which nodes and which connections between the nodes. So you can count up the fragments and say, okay, there's seven fragments that support this orange node. Six of those fragments support a connection between the orange node and the green node, which itself has 13 node, um, fragments supporting it. And then there's three fragments that support the connection between the green node and the red node. There's only one fragment that supports a direct connection between the first and the last node. And so they would figure out what the maximum uh, flow is through this, which would be this bottom path. And they would calculate an abundance for that path and use that to estimate the expression of an isoform that involves exons one, three, and five as they're numbered up here. And then they would remove those fragments and repeat the process to see if there's support for other isoforms. And they do that in an iterative way until you basically run out of fragments. So by doing that, you can get an isoform by isoform level of expression estimate. And like I said, this is like using a lot of really smart math. So they're using graph theory, custom heuristics, more graph theory, optimization theory, if you are interested in the definitions and what they go through it in a very comprehensive way in the paper for string time. The nice thing about this is that unlike many other approaches, you do get that transcript level expression estimation and you get like a kind of um, idea of the certainty and the expression estimate for each isoform as well. There are alternatives. Um, so we're gonna show you basically two or three paths to expression estimation in this workshop. So one will be using this like pretty sophisticated string tie approach, right? Where it's gonna like either use known isoform structures or it can infer isoform structures and estimate TPMs on an isoform by isoform basis. But we can also use this raw count approach. So this is a very popular, much simpler way to go, which is um, kind of not worry about transcript level expression and just think about gene level expression. So you look at each gene locus and you just simply count up the number of reads that you can reliably assign to gene A and then count up the number of reads for gene B. And you use those raw counts in your differential expression statistics. So we're gonna use a program called HTC count to do that counting. Uh, against the known genes from, from Ensemble. There are some caveats to this. So um, one of the most obvious one is that it's not really suitable for transcript level uh, expression estimation. It's really just for gene level. You also have to think a little bit about the complexities of how you assign a read to a feature. So this is showing you um, some of those complexities and some of the options that you have with HTC count. So if you imagine like, a really simple gene like gene A, which is a single exon gene, like an absurdly simple gene, even with that simple gene, it can be a little bit unclear like how you count each read. So like if a read just falls inside a gene and there's no other genes nearby, that's pretty straightforward, right? You can probably assign a count for that read to that gene. But what do you do about cases like this where the read overlaps the gene? Do you count it or do you not count it? And that kind of depends on your application and the confidence you have in your read alignments. Uh, I think for our purposes, we would generally distrust a read like that because it's not consistent with what we know about the, the structure of the gene. Like why is the read starting over here if the transcription of the gene isn't supposed to start yet? Uh, similarly here, right, you have a read that's like, this is not a very realistic read because this would be a tiny intron, but if somehow a read was spanning in a, non-spliced way across two, two parts of a gene, two exons of a gene. You could assign it to that gene, but 
you might want to run it in a strict mode where you say, no, I'm not going to count that towards this gene. Probably in all cases, you would want to count a read like this, right? So this read is nicely spliced across the known structure of this exon exon isoform. So that's like a good an example of a very confident read alignment where you know pretty much any way you would run this, you would assign that that read to this to this gene. And then of course, when you have overlapping genes, there's other considerations, right? So if the gene, the read is overlapping this gene and it doesn't um, overlap any part of the other nearby gene, that's fine. But what do you do about cases like this, right? Where the gene, the read is overlapping both. In some interpretations, you might consider that ambiguous. I think again, here we could use our understanding of the biology of genes and say, well, this read is consistent with this gene. It's not really consistent with this gene because why is it like just going off the end of the gene? So you might count it towards a gene A and not B. But a read like this, you might really not be able to tell. Like, does it belong to gene A or gene B? It applies to them equally. Unless you can use the strand information. So suppose these two genes are overlapping, but they're on opposite strands, and you have stranded RNA-seq data, and you've used the right strand setting, HTC would actually be able to tell, like, oh, actually, this read is um, compatible with the positive strand gene or the negative strand gene, and it would assign it appropriately. So that's how HTC count works. Any questions about like string tie, expression estimation, FPKMs, TPMs, HCC count, any of that? No. Okay. So once we have those expression estimations, either counts or TPMs, we're gonna do differential expression analysis, right? Differential expression analysis is usually about tying the gene expression back to some genotype or phenotype of interest. We want to know which genes or transcripts are being expressed at higher or lower levels in one group of samples versus another. Uh, but the key thing is we want to know which of those differences is significant, right? Significant, which is kind of just trying to account for concepts like variance or noise. So if there's an average expression level in, in one set of samples that's higher than the other, how likely is that to be like a real difference given um, the variability in the data and the number of samples we have? So there's all kinds of different um, statistics you can use. Uh, we are going to use or demonstrate um, probably the ball gown package, DEC2 on the raw counts, and maybe um, something with Callisto Sleuth. But there are literally like probably dozens or maybe hundreds of different packages and statistical packages. Uh, Ballgam uses a particular approach. They use this F test where they compare different models that include the covariate of interest versus not. The details of that are not um, probably terribly important for our purposes here. One reason we chose Ballgam as a demonstration was just that it is an R package that's kind of was developed alongside HiSat and string tie. So it kind of works nicely with string tie. And it does have some kind of nice visualization um, options with it, especially if you want to visualize things like the isoform level expression. So you can create graphics like this where it's showing you, okay, for your gene locus, these are the different transcript structures, and these are the expression levels that we estimate for each of those different isoforms. But as I mentioned, we'll probably also go through DEC2 and the visualizations that come along with that package as well as some other visualizations just using, using like more advanced R approaches. So this is kind of a long running debate, like which one should I use? Should I stick with the FPKM TPMs like from with something like string tie, or should I just use raw counts from something like HTC count or feature count? And there's not um, like really a strong consensus that you really can, should only use one or the other. I think if you're trying to do things like isoform deconvolution, you want to use something like string tie, right? Because that is able to tell you about different isoforms. Generally, we find that FPKM or TPM values are good for visualization. So if you're like trying to make heat maps or calculate fold changes, it's usually an easier starting point because they're a very like normalized value. When you tend to use the counts is more really as an input to the differential expression methods. And there are some very robust statistical packages that take 
raw counts as input. And in some cases, those packages accommodate uh, more complicated experimental designs. So like if you have like a time series experiment or like a multivariate thing where you're comparing like five different conditions, there are some packages that use um, raw counts that support those kind of statistical analyses that maybe there isn't like a, a ready-made package for TPMs. But you can probably kind of get by with both. We tend to basically just do both because we kind of like to have raw counts for certain things and we like to have TPMs for other things. Yeah. Raw counts. So there's no normalization for the length of the genes. It's just that's right. Yeah. So the raw counts themselves, you have to be very cautious in using them because they're just they're just that. They're just raw counts. They're not normalized in any way for the length or the or the library depth. You can calculate your own FPKM from those raw counts relatively easily, right? Like I showed you the formula at the beginning. It's not hard. Um, that would be like kind of the simplest, like least sophisticated FPKM or TPM value. String tie is doing a lot more when it's coming up with the TPM value than just like those simple operations. It's like taking into account um, like the the level of certainty in in its flow network when it's estimating you know different isoform levels. So there's more to those TPM values, um, but you can calculate your own FPKM or TPM from the counts. But mo mostly, what people do is just feed them into these statistical packages, which have concepts of library normalization and gene size normalization kind of built into them, or they're doing statistics in a way where it doesn't matter. So like the gene length, for example when you're comparing um, the expression level of one gene between this set of samples and that set of samples, the gene length is the same. So that kind of cancels out. So generally uh, multiple approaches are a good idea. So we, as I said, run multiple uh, pipelines and then depending on your downstream application, you might say, well, give me the, the intersection of things that are were predicted as differentially, significantly differentially expressed by multiple approaches, and maybe those are really high confident. Or if you're trying to really cast a wide net, maybe you take the union of things so that you don't miss anything, and you'll take anything that is that is identified as DE by one or more approaches. And then finally, just remember some of the basic things that we've learned since the days of microarrays. Um, you basically, have to think about things like multiple testing, right? So more than ever, we're doing, we're talking about a lot of tests here, right? Like when you had a microarray, we realized a problem that if you're gonna test for differential expression of 30,000 genes, whatever was on the array, that's a lot of tests. And you're gonna start to see some significant differences between samples by chance. But now you've got like hundreds of thousands of genes, right? Cause this, some of these total RNA experiments, you're detecting all these link RNAs and different kinds of gene species. Uh, and you might even be looking at like expression levels um, at like individual feature levels like exons or exon exon junctions. So you could have hundreds of thousands or millions of statistical tests you're performing. So um, just be aware of that. Most of the methods we're gonna introduce you to do come with uh, multiple testing correction approaches built into them. And then the downstream interpretation, we're going to do some of these, but this is really could be a whole other course. So um, the expression estimates and differential expression results we're going to get can be fed into many downstream pipelines. We're going to provide some supplementary R to show you lots of different ways of visualizing that data and interpreting it, doing things like clustering and heat maps. Um, you can use it as input to classification or machine learning exercises, pathway analysis, and so on. And we are going to cover some of those. So just to reorient all of us, we have been getting ready for um, this moment where we're actually going to do expression estimation, right? So we have our raw data, we've made alignments, and we're going to run string tie to do expression estimation. And that's going to be the input to ball gown for differential expression analysis and visualization. But we're also going to show you this other path where um, we take those high set alignments and instead we do feature counting with HCC count. And then that will go through um, one of these other packages like EDGEAR or DEC2 to do differential expression and visualization. So that's where we're gonna go after the break. Any questions leading into that?
the uh, on thing power be uh, I would guess that um, string tie is much more computationally expensive because it's what it's doing is much more complicated. Um, the, re, the feature counting HTC approach is probably more efficient, but yeah. yeah. And then once you have the raw counts, that's like very simple. Um, although the TPM values are also pretty simple for downstream steps. But I think, yeah, that step of like string tie has a lot of sophistication built into it where it's like considering this the structure at the isoform level, potentially inferring novel isoforms. Um, yeah, doing this kind of like sophisticated abundance estimation based on flow theory and stuff, yeah. Whereas the, the counting is literally just kind of like an overlap analysis. Like how does my read, the positions of my read alignment compare to the positions of known genes? multiple approaches to accomplish you know similar things do you find that it's a common place for critique when it comes to like grant writing or submitting things for publication or are they generally accepted as equivalent like people questioning the specific choice you made given that there's all these different options exactly. yeah that that does happen um I would say like over time, certain approaches have become very well established. So like the feature count plus DEC2 is very, very well established at this point. I doubt you will get a lot of pushback from your viewers on that because it's just so well established. I would say probably this is the same thing for like the string tie um, ball gown approach, but there are some others where I have seen that, like I'm not, that particular, but I've been on papers where I was reviewing, then another reviewer like really complained that they used the RSEM method, which is also pretty popular, but some like statistician had a gripe with some of the assumptions they were making or something. Yeah, it can happen, but I feel like that's less the case. Like I think there's a generally um, equal skepticism of expression results like if you do expression analysis, RNA-seq and expression analysis and pathway analysis, it's kind of, a lot of times it's sort of a hypothesis generating exercise. And so if you were to just like present that as like the key findings of your paper and the final conclusion, no matter which methods you use to get there, you will get pushback. But it won't be like, why did you use string tie and not DEC2? It'll be like, okay, you found some differential expression results that's cool, but now convince me that it's real. Like what in vitro validation data do you have to back it up? Or what in vivo studies did you do? Or like, that that's what I see more than like griping over the specific method. <laughs>